good. So good morning, everyone. Today, we are going to jump in and start talking about condensation heat transfer. We'll probably spend the majority of the day talking about condensation. And then on Thursday, we will talk a little bit about radiation heat transfer. And then next Tuesday, I believe is the last day of classes. And so we will have a review day to kind of as a speak now or forever hold your peace kind of thing in anticipation of the final exam. Before we jump into everything, are there any questions from last week that I can answer? All right, if not, let's get talking about condensation heat transfer. And so for condensation heat transfer, we can define condensation as a system where the vapor pressure or the temperature of our system and the temperature of vapor pressure is about that of saturation, which can be accomplished by bringing our fluid bringing a vapor into contact with a solid whose surface temperature T sub S is below the saturation temperature. or as I can say, TS is less than T set. So our driving force for condensation can be expressed as T sat minus TS. However, one thing that we can note is that unlike boiling, condensation can occur through contact with other fluids. Yeah, you can think of, you know, things like fog and stuff. So EG fog is a good example. Now, there are two distinct forms of condensation. The first one being film condensation. And the second being dropwise condensation. So when looking at film condensation, we can state that in this form, our condensate forms a liquid film of thickness delta around our surface and that as opposed to dropwise condensation where we simply have our condensate 
forms droplets on our surface. instead of a continuous film. And so, expanding our discussion on film condensation, another thing we can also observe is that the thickness of our film or the liquid film increases in the flow direction as more condensate forms. And like film boiling, film condensation also presents an added resistance to heat transfer in our system. Or I can state that the liquid film present <laughs> results and an added heat transfer resistance. You know, as compared to dropwise in that there is no development of a secondary heat transfer resistance. So based on this, which form of condensation heat transfer will have a higher heat flux? So James, what do you think? Will it be dropwise or film condensation that's gonna have a, a higher heat flux? It's 50-50 shot. Dropwise. All right. Anyone else agree, disagree? Wouldn't it be film? Because if you have that extra heat transfer resistance, and since one over R is U, then you have a higher Q. Or am I getting on like the wrong thought? Repeat that again, I'm sorry, I cut out. Like since it has like an extra resistance and you do one over the resistance for the overall transfer coefficient, wouldn't it be, um, wouldn't the film have higher? Is that just like the wrong like thought process for that? The film would have a higher resistance. You are correct. And so for this, dropwise condensation will have a higher heat flux. And we can find on average, the heat flux of our film 
or I should say the heat flux of our dropwise condensation is going to be five to ten times what we would expect in film condensation heat transfer. So there is an issue in this. What do you guys anticipate that issue being between film condensation and dropwise condensation? Anyone? Let's see, I'm gonna go my list. Mackenzie, what do you think is the issue regarding dropwise and film condensation? And that we do have much higher heat flux. Um, I'm not really sure. Mitch, do you have an idea? Do you wanna help her out? Oh, um, I mean, there could, there could be a lot of things. I'm thinking, the film is going to have a higher surface temperature since it's coming in a lot more contact than like droplets. But I don't know. You know, there's a lot of a lot of properties. All right. So the issue is let me move this out of the way. If I have a system let's say I have, I'm condensing on this plate and I have drops form and I have really good heat transfer. What's gonna happen to that system as I have droplets form? Wouldn't the plate get really hot since that's higher heat transfer? Well, it won't really get hot. We, we, we can assume that the temperature of the plate is regulated so that even though you're having heat go into the plate, the temperature isn't going to change. Uh, will there eventually be enough droplets so that it'll form a film? That is exactly correct. Very quickly, because you have that higher heat transfer, you will eventually end up with a film. Meaning that if you have really good heat transfer and you're, you're designing everything properly, that dropwise heat transfer system is going to very, very quickly become a film condensation heat transfer system. And so I would say dropwise condensation quickly becomes film condensation if operating efficiently. Meaning yes, you have a higher heat transfer rate existing in dropwise condensation, but in terms of overall effectiveness as well as it's the word productivity that's a good word right because even if you can get a few drops here and there with the high heat transfer rate at the end of the day we want productivity and, and so that means 
your system's quickly going to become a film condensation system. And, and what that implies is that for most systems that we consider, we're only going to focus on developing expressions around film condensation. Because if the majority of our operation is going to exist in that, you know, form, that's what we plan and design for. Then my second follow-up question is, how could we promote dropwise condensation? Are you asking like how to just keep it at dropwise and not to film or just promote it to start? Yeah, how do you how would we keep it in a dropwise form if we wanted to? Um, couldn't you do that if you made sure that TS and TSAT were closer together so the driving force is smaller? You could. The driving force would be smaller, so your productivity would be low. That would be one way. Does anybody have another way or another idea? What about if you like scrape the droplets off? Yeah, you could agitate your surface. So you could have low driving force. We could agitate our surface. Could you coat the surface with some kind of chemical to prevent um, too much droplet formation? You could. That would be an interesting way to do it. So you can, you can do the Rain-X method, right? Give it that nice squeaky, you know, clean surface. The only issue there is it would present another layer of resistance to heat transfer. So could that work? Definitely. Would it reduce your heat transfer rate? Also probably. Another thing that you could look at, you could do technically, is you could have your vapor, vapor flow across your surface at a high rate. So you just, you know, like almost like a blower type situation where you have a high shear rate at that surface. It could that would do one of two things. It would increase that heat transfer coefficient along the surface. And two, it would ensure that you know, one, it would, you know, inhibit film formation, but it would also minimize the thickness of that film. Where the you know, the thickness of that film is going to directly relate to the heat transfer resistance that emerges in that system. So those are a few things that you can do. However, if, if we're honest and we're looking at heat transfer equipment, i.e. exchangers, it's going to be hard to do a lot of these systems, which as kind of what I said, a lot of times we just design assuming films are going to form and ensure we have good productivity for those systems. So with that, we can talk about film condensation a little bit more which we will do for the rest of the class today. So in film condensation, we find that the flow regime will strongly influence strongly influences the projected heat transfer rate as determined by a heat transfer coefficient. Because once again, this is another form of convection. 
And so what that means is we have to consider what flow regime that we're going to be operating in, or that film is going to flow under as it forms. And we can calculate the Reynolds number in our system as the density of our liquid times the velocity of the liquid as it flows times the hydraulic diameter of the liquid divided by the viscosity of the liquid. And the hydraulic diameter is going to be calculated as four times the thickness of the film, or four times delta. And if you wanted to, you can also calculate the hydraulic diameter as four times the cross-sectional area of the film uh, divided by the wetted perimeter. So I'll say that delta is going to be the film thickness or condensate. A sub C is the cross-sectional area. of condensate flow. And P is going to be the wetted perimeter. However, these are going to be strong functions of geometry. Actually, I shouldn't say strong functions. They are functions of geometry. And so it's a lot easier to kind of, irregardless of your geometry, to you know understand and visualize the film thickness. In addition to identification of our Reynolds number, we also have to consider the implications of film condensation heat transfer. And that if we're looking at our system, and like I said, I'm gonna to go to this vertical plate because we spend a decent amount of time on it. I have, let's say, I'm gonna make it two dimensional. A condensate that's gonna form kind of like this where I can describe my thickness delta like this. And if it's a vertical plate, I would anticipate the thickness of that film is going to increase linearly as I move down and as the fluid flows essentially down the plate. And what we find is that, all right, my vapor is green, it's hanging out, out here, right? The temperature of the vapor is gonna be about the saturation temperature. It's gonna come in contact with that liquid film and condense. However, the liquid film is also in contact with the surface, which is below the saturation temperature. And what we find is as that liquid film flows, the temperature of the liquid, which I'll call T sub L, is gonna sit somewhere between T sat, and T sub S. And what that means is there's going to be some degree of subcooling in our film. And so what that means is in order to develop these expressions appropriately, we have to determine what's known as a modified latent heat of vaporization. to account for this subcooling. cooling 
and I call this lambda star. And so we can calculate our modified latent heat of vaporization as our original lambda plus 0 0.68 times the heat capacity of our liquid at saturation times our driving force of T sat minus T s. And in the case, or say in the event, that the temperature of the vapor is greater than saturation, we can calculate another form of our modified latent heat of vaporization of lambda plus 0 0.68 times the heat capacity of our liquid times our driving force T sat minus T sub S plus the heat capacity of our vapor times the temperature of the vapor minus the saturation temperature. And so what we have is our original latent heat, our anticipated subcooling, and our liquid film. This is the cooling of the vapor, if necessary. And our modified, which is our net energy loss. All right, so any questions on what we've discussed so far today? Up until this point. I have a question. Go for it. What is lambda? Lambda is our latent heat of vaporization. So that's a state, like from liquid to gas or from gas to liquid. Yeah, that's the energy associated with that phase transition. Okay. And if T vapor is greater than T saturation, is that like degrees of superheat greater than? Yeah, that, that would be in the event that you have a superheated vapor entering in your system instead of a vapor existing at saturation. There would be additional energy that would have to be removed to get condensate to form, right? And we can, we can calculate that as a function of the heat capacity and that temperature difference. All righty, thank you. Of course. And so with this modified heat transfer or latent heat, we can describe, and here I'll go back to black. With lambda star, we can describe our heat transfer, right? as Q condensation 
is equal, I probably I'll confuse you with conduction, I'll just say CD. As H A sub S T sat minus T S, which equals M dot lambda star, where M dot is our condensate flow rate. All right, any follow-up questions? Okay, so this begs of a question of how are we going to calculate our heat transfer rate? Or I mean my heat transfer coefficient. Well, that's going to largely depend once again on our flow regime. And so we have a couple of systems of interest. The first one that we're going to look at is condensation on vertical plates. So for vertical plates, there's a couple expressions depending on whether we're in laminar flow or turbulent flow. What I can't say is, in general, the heat transfer coefficient for a vertical plate can be expressed as 0 0.943 times gravity times the density of the liquid times density of the liquid minus density of the vapor times our modified lambda times the thermal conductivity of our liquid divided by the viscosity of our liquid times our saturation temperature minus our surface temperature times the height of our vertical plate all to the one fourth power. And then I'll give you guys a minute to write that down.
And so what we can say is we have some s simplified expressions depending on our flow regime. So for low Reynolds numbers, less than 30, we can also express this heat transfer coefficient as 1.47 times the thermal conductivity of the liquid times Reynolds number to the negative one third times an expression of gravity divided by the kinematic viscosity of the liquid squared to the one third power. Dr. Lopez? Yes. Your um, heat transfer coefficient equation looks different from the one posted on the slides. Does it? Just a tad. Let me take a look. Where? If you don't mind me asking, I'm looking at what I just wrote and what I put up. They look the same to me. I, um, I will go for it. Is, um, it looks like K is cubed. Oh, I see. KL cubed. Well, then give me one second and I will double check that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Kind of make sure we have the right forms. Figure out if there's a typo where the typo is. Okay. It is cubed. Thank you. Update my notes. Thank you for that. And then there's an additional L in the denominator. I have the L. It's here. It's the height of the plate. So if we consider Reynolds numbers above 30, what we find is that waves form along the liquid vapor interface. Of the film. And so we consider this, you know, wavy laminar because we're really good at making up names. And this wavy laminar exists for Reynolds numbers between 30 and 1800. And we can calculate the heat transfer coefficient in wavy laminar. as a Reynolds number times our thermal conductivity of our liquid divided by 1.08 times our Reynolds number to the 1.22 minus 5.2 times gravity over kinematic viscosity of the liquid squared to the one third.
And if you want to, you can combine a Reynolds number expression with your wavy expression to calculate the Reynolds number for wavy laminar as 4.81 plus 3.70 times the height of the plate times the thermal conductivity of our liquid times T set minus T S divided by the viscosity of the liquid times our modified lamellar vaporization times our gravity kinematic viscosity term G over VL squared to the one third all to the 0 0.820 power, 182. But I would probably recommend use the other expression. This is only useful if you're missing some information and that you can't calculate it via the traditional means. Is that the same L as the heat transfer coefficient from the first one? Um, yes, it's the height of the vertical plate. I'll double check them. Oh, for sure. Yeah, these equations admittedly do feel like alphabet soup. always how I feel about a lot of um, expressions and engineering equations. And lastly, for turbulent flow, Reynolds number above 1800. We calculate its heat transfer coefficient as Reynolds number times thermal conductivity of the liquid divided by 8750 plus 58 times our Prandtl number of our liquid to the negative 0.5 power times the quantity of Reynolds number to the 0.75 minus 253 times our gravity over kinematic viscosity of our liquid squared to the one third power. All right. Any questions or do you need me to go back to make sure that you have the equation written down properly? I believe these are on the slides that I've provided. I have a question. On the very first formula, you have um, H vert, and then you give a formula that is a Reynolds number less than 30. So are they just equated? One's just like more a more simplified form, or does it have a different like case, I guess? Repeat that. On slide 15, you have laminar regime, and then you have one, and then you have the other. And then the bottom one says Reynolds number less than 30. So what is the top one? All laminar um, flow regime? It's, yeah, it's, it's an approximation for the entire laminar flow regime. But you can get a little bit more accurate with some of the more nuanced equations. I do wanna let you know there does seem to be a small error by small, I mean, there's an error on slide 17 that I'm just now catching. Thanks for updating slides, Google. Um, 
The equation on slide 17 isn't for the heat transfer coefficient, it's for Reynolds number. That's why it doesn't match up with what I just gave you. So I will update that right after class immediately, re-upload slides and send an email. All right, so how do we anticipate SA rotating the plate? Influence our heat transfer rate. Point slash heat transfer coefficient. Do we anticipate that would enhance or hinder our heat transfer? What I mean by this is we're looking at our plate like this versus like this. What the heck just happened? We got our film here and we got our film here. It would go up. Which it one? Be Which one would be better? The slanted plate would have a higher heat transfer coefficient. Okay. Anyone agree or disagree? What do you think, Cameron? I think I agree. Okay, what we find is that actually rotating that heat transfer or that vertical plate off of that vertical would actually result in a decrease. We see a decrease in heat transfer rate. As our, in this system, if we're really looking at it, gravity's inducing flow in a lot of this. And so tilting it away from that vertical is going to mean less of that gravitational force is going to be exerted in the flow direction. And we can calculate the heat transfer coefficient of the incline plate by simply calculating the heat transfer coefficient if it were vertical, and then adding a correction factor of cosine theta to the one fourth power, where the theta that we're looking at is this angle here away from the vertical. Does that make sense? Or do you think it's fake news? Can I explain what? 
why that's you, different? Yes, sir. Yeah, of course. And so if I've got a plate, or, or hmm. so for this system with my plate, right? I've got liquid and f film that forms and it's flowing. And it's largely going to be flowing in this vertical direction due to gravity. It's going to fall under its own weight, essentially. Which means as I move down with gravity, the liquid film thickness is going to increase and its velocity is going to be directly proportional to the fact of, you know, the gravitational term. Or U is a proportional to gravity. If I rotate that plate away from the vertical, then less of the gravitational force is going to be moving in that flow direction, right? Because now in, in this that situation, my triangle looks like this, right? So this, this is the liquid. The direction of flow is here. Gravity is in this direction. And so if this being theta, I find that you know, U is going to be proportional of G cosine theta. Does that make sense? And I know you probably are tired of me saying that. I wish I had a better way to, to ask. And so since that plate's moving off that vertical, less of the gravitational force is going to be in inducing the flow on the film. And so we can correct for a heat transfer coefficient as it relates to our anticipated heat transfer rate by our corrective term of cosine theta to the one fourth power. So normally we use gravity like we don't enjoy gravity, but here we've used it to our advantage. Yes, that's what's inducing the flow in this film system. Because there's no effective way to induce flow in a condensation system with a film forming outside of just the gravitational field force. You couldn't apply pressure to the system? You could, that's just gonna compress your vapor. That's gonna influence a whole lot more in your system. Uh, okay. So that's essentially what we can see in vertical plates. However, as it relates to us, as we use heat transfer equipment, what we're more often concerned with is the use of tubes and tube banks. And so if we consider now, instead of plates, horizontal tubes, like what you might find in a shell and tube heat exchanger, We can calculate the heat transfer coefficient for a horizontal tube as 0 0.729 times gravity, times the density of our liquid, times density of our liquid, minus density of our vapor, times lambda star, thermal conductivity of our liquid, divided by viscosity, 
times T sat minus T sub S times the diameter of our tube to the one fourth power. And once again, it's here. This case of L should be cubed. Cubed in. Yes, it is in the slides. And so with that, in order to identify heat transfer coefficient of a vertical tube, we can apply a correction factor of the heat transfer coefficient of a horizontal tube times 1.29 times the diameter of our tube over the length of the tube to the one fourth power. And so this allows us to identify the heat transfer coefficient on a tube or a pipe, irregardless of the orientation. Because once again, if this was inclined, we can just apply our cosine theta correction factor. And so you can see kind of how it builds off the similar principles that we see in vertical plates, just some of the constants change. So for horizontal tube, we have the expression. If we're interested in a vertical tube, I'm not sure why we would, but we can apply that correction. And if the tube was at an incline, we can correct for that as well. But what we're most often concerned with is two banks, i.e. condensing on the shell side of a shell and tube heat exchanger. And what we find is that if we're looking at one tube versus a bank of tubes, the condensation that forms on this horizontal tube will look a little like this, right? We have a film and that film will kind of, you know, form droplets off of that tube. And we can quantify the film thickness and calculate our heat transfer rate by our heat transfer coefficient. But in our tube bank, the tubes on the top are gonna to influence the tubes underneath. Right? So we end up with this kind of waterfallish type effect as you might imagine. As our vapor condenses and form liquids on this tube bank. Which means we need to find an effective way of describing the influence of tubes on top of each other. And so the way we can do that is by stating 
that we can find our horizontal heat transfer coefficient in a tube bank. As the horizontal, our original H value, or H horizontal, times one over N to the one fourth. where N is the number of tubes arranged in a single column. or if you wanted to, you can ex combine those two expressions and simply state H horizontal for a tube bank is 0 0.729 times the quantity G row L, row L minus row V times lambda star K sub L cubed divided by mu L T sat minus T S times N times D all to the one quarter power. So any questions on looking at tubes and tube banks? What's well, a single column? like an arrangement of tubes or like the whole. So in this example that I've drawn here that you can see, right? I've got 12 tubes in a three by four fashion, right? So in this system, I have four columns and three rows. Or in each column, I have three tubes. So in this example here, N would equal three. Column is a okay, this would this column. yeah this would be a column so the number of tubes in a single column or in an array it's just a total number of rows however you want to look at it yeah we're going back to like linear algebra principles looking at matrices nobody wants that. Any other questions? All right, let's take a look at an example. We'll see if we have enough time. So we have saturated steam and atmospheric pressure it condenses on a two meter high by three meter wide vertical plate maintained at 80 degrees Celsius. Determine the rate of heat transfer by condensation to the plate and our anticipated condensation rate. So we're looking for Q dot and M dot in this system.
All right. So for this example, we're condensing on a vertical plate. It's two meters by three meters. And I believe I said it was two meters high. And so for that L is gonna be two meters, the surface area is gonna be six meters squared. The saturation temperature, since it's um, at atmospheric pressure is 100 degrees Celsius, the temperature of the surface of the plate is 80 degrees. And then we need a whole bunch of thermodynamic properties of steam at 100 degrees Celsius. So the density is going to be approximately 965 kilograms per cubic meter. The heat capacity is going to be approximately 4206 joules per kilogram Kelvin. The viscosity is going to be approximately 0.315 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms per meter second. The thermal conductivity is approximately 0.675 watts per meter Kelvin, and kinematic viscosity, because we'll need it, is 0.326 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. We also need the latent heat, lambda, which is 2257. joules per kilogram. So in this problem, we're assuming the, the steam is entering saturated. So to find our lambda star, we have lambda plus 0.68 times Cp T sat minus Ts, or 2257 joules per kilogram plus 0 0.68 times 4206 joules per kilogram Kelvin times 20 degrees C or 20 Kelvin if it'll make you feel better. Sometimes people get mad when I mix Kelvin and Celsius. So with this calculation, What do we get? Oh, I screwed up. That didn't seem right. This is times 10 to the third. So that seemed like a really low value. Or I can just call it kilojoules, whatever you want to do. And so what we get for our modified latent heat is 2314 kilojoules per kilogram, because I'm tired of the exponent. And at this point, what we could do is we can solve for our Reynolds numbers, rho L mu dH over um, mu. However, we don't know 
delta. And so when you don't know your delta, what you can look at is identification of the Reynolds number through some of those laminar expressions. There's also a turbulent expression. And you can identify, basically plug in, find the expression that gives you the right Reynolds number, and then it falls in the category. Meaning you can calculate Reynolds laminar, Reynolds wavy laminar, and or Reynolds turbulent and find where the Reynolds number checks out. Once again, I'm going to update those in the, the lecture slides so that you know what those are. For this system, it ends up being wavy laminar as the Reynolds number is about 1300. This is for the sake of time, I'm going to skip that step, which means to solve for our heat transfer coefficient, we need to use the H wavy laminar term, which was approximately Reynolds number times thermal conductivity divided by 1.08 times Reynolds number to the 1.22 minus 5.2 times gravity, kinematic viscosity of the liquid squared to the one third. So plugging in, what does the actual value become? Yeah, 1300, I think it's 1287. I have 1287 times my thermal conductivity which is 0.675 divided by 1.08 times 1287 to the 1 1.22 minus 5.2 times 9.81 meters per second squared divided by the kinematic viscosity, which was 0 0.326 times 10 to the minus sixth meters squared per second squared all to the one third. And that gives an H value of approximately 5,850 watts per meter squared Kelvin. I'll stop for one second. With this heat transfer coefficient, we can then solve for our Q condensation as H A sub S T sat minus T S or 5,850, clean that up, watts per meter squared Kelvin times our six meter squared times our driving force of 20 degrees C. We found this and we get a value of about 702 kilowatts. I can double check that math really quick. Yep. And since we also know that our condensation is going to be m dot times lambda star, our M, our mass, our condensation rate is simply our 702 kilowatts divided by our modified enthalpy of vaporization, which was, I believe, 2314 kilojoules per kilogram. Or about 0.3 kilograms per second and condensation. So 
we'll go over this one more time on Thursday. I might also go ahead and jump on to one more example on condensation heat transfer, just because, you know, added emphasis. But are there any questions on condensation heat transfer, the mechanisms, and the calculations? And if you have follow-up, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to me via email, stop by office hours, and ask your questions. I'd be more than happy to assist. I don't understand the Reynolds number part. Yeah, I'll admit that's the a part that I, I kind of glossed over. And so to add further detail there, so in this system, we could calculate Reynolds number if we knew our hydraulic diameter, but hydraulic diameter is a function of this film thickness. And in this problem, and in a lot of systems, you're not going to know that film thickness. Which means you have to find an, have an alternate way of calculating your Reynolds number. Which, as I kind of illustrated a little bit, I, I hate scrolling back up, I'm sorry. There's essentially Reynolds number expressions for each of these systems. So in wavy laminar, we can calculate the Reynolds number like this. And so what you would most likely do is calculate Reynolds for each flow regime and identify the Reynolds that matches the flow regime. Which means if you use the low Reynolds number Reynolds equation and you found that it gave you a Reynolds number of 900, that doesn't match up. But in this one, if I calculated Reynolds using this vert wavy, I got about 1287. And it falls in the range of 30 and 1800 which tells me that for the system, we're most likely going to be in this wavy laminar regime. And we just calculated the amount of matter condensating? Yes. So yeah, you're identifying essentially the heat transfer rate as well as the expected condensation rate for that system simply knowing the fact that you have a plate of that size at that surface temperature. That's insane. Any other fuller, any other follow up? All right, if not, thank you guys for your attention and attendance. And I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. You're welcome. Take care.